The two readings this morning are both about widows. So, uh, and as I was reading them and preparing to read them out loud this morning, uh, they both struck me in a, a new, different way. So I, I hope you can maybe hear these familiar stories in a, in a new light this morning. The first is from uh, the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, Would you please bring me just a little water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, Oh, also, bring me a, b- a bite of bread also. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I only have a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left over to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did, as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. The second reading is from the New Testament book of Mark, the Gospel according to Mark, the 12th chapter. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people gave large amounts. And then... A poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. And Jesus called his disciples over and said to them, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave out of a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Here ends the reading. Does it sound like abundant life? There's many, there are many people and places where we would say, heck no, that doesn't sound like abundant life. On the verge of death, giving everything that you have. But both of these women give us a beautiful picture of what the abundant life in Jesus is all about. If you haven't caught it yet, if you've been here over the last few weeks, the abundant life that Jesus promises is not based in things. Time out. Oh, Sunday school. Yes. Okay. The kids are going like, we have to sit here all this time? No. All right. If you are a Sunday school age, that's like, up through fifth grade, and um, and you would like to go to Sunday school with, is who, who's Linda? Oh, they've been filtering out. All right, good. If you are of Sunday school age and you'd rather go to Sunday school, keep just keep filtering out. Sorry about that, my fault. Thanks, Jim, for catching that. Okay, so back to the abundant life. If you haven't figured it out already. The abundant life in Jesus is not about things. And it is all about our hearts and the condition of our hearts. It's not about pleasing God by being better than someone else. It's not about giving because, well, that's what we're supposed to do, right? Abundant life with Jesus is a heart condition. Now, what do I mean by that? Think 
of someone you love deeply. What would you do for them? I'm guessing that in in most or a lot, at least, of our hearts, we just said, well, anything or just about anything, right? Now think of Jesus. How do you love Jesus or how deeply do you love Jesus? And what would you do for him? As I talk to many of you these days, I sense this deep longing in us for there to be something more to this Jesus thing than than just going to church. And and while we have that, that sense, and being in community is never a bad thing, we go, well, I don't know. I mean, like... I'm okay with God. I just, I don't really feel it these days. Or I say that I want it, but then when I have to choose how to invest my time, there's so many other things to invest my time in. And Jesus is always going to be there, right? So it doesn't really matter. I mean, like God forgives us everything, right? So if I just kind of ignore him for a while or kind of, kind of say, hey, every once in a while, maybe hi on a Sunday morning, like it'll be okay because God loves me just the way I am, which is true. But if we want the deep love of Jesus in our lives, but are just hoping that Jesus is some kind of how going to go poof, you have me in your life. It doesn't work that way. Any relationship worth having is worth investing in. We think that about our relationships here on earth. Why would we not think that about our relationship with God? So I ask you again, today, where is your heart? These two women in today's scripture story, like they have this beautiful thing to teach us about heart conditions. The widow of Zarephath, she and her son are down to the last ingredients that they have. And, and we have to know this. Being a widow in, in biblical times was, was, unless you had family to take care of you, it was kind of a death sentence. Because women didn't work the way we work today and provide for themselves. Like, they had to be provided for. And so life was really difficult if you were a widow without an extended family to take care of you. And so this widow of Zarephath, like we don't really know what her circumstance is other than we know that she is down to her last little bit of bread-making ingredients. And then this guy comes along and he's like, hey, can you get me a cup of water? I know. I would say get it yourself. But... In those days, right, she would have, she, God knew when to put me, what t- part of time of the world to put me in and not, right? But the widow goes, I think she probably goes, okay, I'll, I'll go get you. And then he's like, oh, wait. Hey, make me some bread too. Now, does he know what is, um, does he, sorry, I turned my phone off. I mean, I can hear, I have, I have um, the peanuts piano playing. That's my ring, and I heard it. <laughs> All right, now it's off. Sorry. Okay, squirrel. Um, so back to the widow of Zarephath. This guy, she has no idea who he really is, right? He comes, and he says, give me a cup of water. And then he's like, hey, give me some bread, too. And by the way, Make my loaf first. 
Okay, well, that's pretty audacious, right, to ask. And the widow is like, like hey, I, I don't have enough. And Elijah says, by the power of God, you will have enough to eat. If you were the widow of Zarephath and you had enough for one loaf of bread, would you trust the word of God enough to bake Elijah's bread first? I don't know the answer to that for me. I want to say yes, but I don't know. But the widow's heart condition was one of trust in God through Elijah. And there is more than enough. Then we shift to the widow in the temple. And I kind of picture Jesus and his, di- and his disciples like sitting in the back kind of watching everybody go up for communion, seeing who's putting stuff in the basket, who's not, who's wearing what. You know, they're making little comments. And and they see, okay, don't tell me you don't do that. They watch all these people go by, putting in large sums of money. And it's easy for uh, them and us to think, oh, those people are so generous. They're so, so wonderful. And, and then this widow comes. Yeah, and remember the precarious situation that widows lived in. And she takes two small coins. But it's like everything she has. And she puts it in the offering. Somewhere I believe that she knows the love of God and God's promise to provide. And I'm pretty sure she had no idea that day how that was going to happen, but she knew God's call on her life was to be generous. She gives not out of her surplus, but out of her need. Out of the very thing that she most needs, she gives. Would we, are we, like the widow? It's not a matter of how much was given. It is a matter of her heart condition. And so I ask us again today, does your heart run after Jesus? Not just, not just running after church or activities or not one particular way of worshiping or, or doing all the right things that you're supposed to do as a Christian. Not that, but does your heart run after Jesus? Do you find ways to engage your heart with the heart of God for you? Or are you just waiting for God to show up and go, boom, now you're in love with me. Boom, now you feel this deep connection to me. Do you know anything in this world that works that way? No, I don't think so. Friends, We are living in a time of life where faith in Jesus is not at the center of very many lives. At least not here in North America. I believe that our desire for power, our desire to be in charge, our desire to be on top, be the best, and I think even more dangerous, our desire to be comfortable at all costs. These are the center of our lives. Seeking Jesus' heart and teachings, yearning to be in his presence, putting ourselves in places where we encounter Jesus, willing to be uncomfortable for the sake of community together. I, 
I don't know. I think being comfortable often trumps those things. Are we willing to be uncomfortable for the sake of community together? Or are we willing for the sake of showing Jesus' love to the other, whoever the other is in our lives? Do you find your peace in knowing and leaning into the one who is already holding you? We will not find that in the things of this world. We will not find that in the things of this world. But my friends, this is what it means to love Jesus. Now, I am by no means perfect at this, not by a long shot. But I can tell you this. When I let go of striving to make Jesus happy with me, or, or even you know, more like this to my heart, not be disappointed in me. When I let going, go of that, and I accepted the truth that Jesus loves me as I am, period, When I lean into that, instead of choosing to believe that there is some right prescribed way to encounter Jesus, you know, like getting up in the morning and sitting with a journal and a Bible for at least 30 minutes. Now, for those of you that that works with, great, go for it. It does not. I think the morning works better when it starts at 10. I'm just saying, right? So early morning, me and Jesus, I love him, but that just isn't going to happen on a regular basis, right? But how does your heart connect with the heart of God? Since I chose to let go of the striving and, and trying to do all the right things that I was supposed to do and, and leaned into God's love for me, leaned into Jesus with me, leaned into the ways where my heart connects with the heart of God through music, through kids, through my family. Yes, through reading scripture, but not at some prescribed time. When I lean into that, I could then embrace the truth that Jesus really loves me and desires to be in relationship with me. Not a, you got to do this and this and this and this. That's not relationship. Relationship is, let's walk this together. I know who holds me. No matter the circumstances of today. Get cancer. Get it again. I know who holds me. Anxious, wondering what will happen in the years to come, I know who holds me. Filled with joy or sorrow or laughter or tears, I know who holds me. No matter, my friends, no matter what this day brings or tomorrow, or the next, I am confident that Jesus holds me. And I am confident that Jesus holds you. And my heart overflows with joy and love, knowing that I have peace that is not based in the circumstances of today. Does it get hijacked with the things of this world sometimes? Absolutely. Do I still get anxious and fearful and wondering at times? Yes. But I can confidently say, in all of that, 
as well as in the joy and the laughter and the love and the best of days, I am held by Jesus. You don't have to earn it. I don't have to be good enough for it. I can't be. I can't strive to, to make it happen. I simply accept the truth that I am held by Jesus. And then I choose to live out of that place. And yes, like I said, I do squirrel over here. Fear over here. Worrying and anxiety right here and right here. And I come back. Come back, come back, come back to the truth that I am held. And that truth changes my heart. It makes me want to be with Jesus more and more. It makes me want to be with others who know this same truth like the type of authentic community that I think we all long for but are afraid to step into. Truth, (coughs) excuse me, that changes my heart. And when my heart turns to fear, to anger, to distrust, and it always will, it will continue, Jesus isn't waiting to say, oh yeah, told you so, you don't really love me. Or Jesus is not going, ah, I'm so disappointed in you. Jesus is waiting with arms wide open to remind each one of us, child of mine, you are loved and held. Now, I don't know about you, but when I love someone deeply, I want to do things for them. I want to be with them. I want to surprise them with little gifts or showing up when they don't expect it. I like to spend time with them. I like to do things that bring them joy, not to earn their love, but because I love them. This is the type of relationship Jesus longs for with us. But too often we are caught up in ourselves. We have an I problem. I don't have time. I don't have money. I don't have resources. I don't have space in my calendar. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I'd rather stay surfacey so I can't get hurt. I choose darting in and out of Jesus with community because I don't want to get too close. You might change my heart. Then you might ask things of me. Are we, are you too caught up in the eyes? Our mission here at Faith, if you know it, say it with me. Just the first part of it. Changing lives through the power of Jesus. Stop right there. How can we expect to do that if we are not falling deeply in love with Jesus ourselves and allowing Jesus to shape and mold our hearts? The abundant life we each long for won't be found in the things of this world. In this world where we always need something more, something new, something something that somebody else has. Abundant life is not found in these things. It is found in relationship with Jesus. Being Jesus' people. So I ask you today, leave you with this question. What's your heart condition? You pray with me. For all the walls that we put up, for all the reasons we come up with, for all the ways which we, we say we want to be with you, Jesus, but we distance ourselves. We're sorry. Holy Spirit, come and break down those walls so that our hearts 
might fall more deeply in love with you each day. Not because we're striving, not because we have to, not because it's what's expected, but because we love you. Lord, let us know that no matter what happens today, you are holding us because that's where the relationship begins. Jesus, change our lives. I pray it in your name and power. Amen.